Welcome back to Anatomy on Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. In the previous video, we talked about the various important cells of the retina. We talked about the photoreceptor cells, the bipolar cells, and ganglion cells, and then we looked at how they activate and inhibit in series. And we saw that in the light, actually, it's counterintuitive, but in the light, the photoreceptor cells are actually hyperpolarized, which leads to inhibition of the bipolar cell, but bipolar cells by nature are inhibitory cells. So inhibiting inhibition leads to default activation of the ganglion cell. If you want more detail on that, please go back and watch the previous video. And so in this case, we would perceive light. Now we're going to backtrack and talk about the physiology of the photoreceptors, and we do that for two reasons. One, the physiology of the photoreceptor is better understood, and two, they're extremely important since they're the cell that actually detects the light in the first place. All right, now to understand the photoreceptor cell, what we have to understand is they have a protein embedded in one of their uh, kind of inner membranes. They have what's called a disc membrane, as you see right here. Okay, it's in purple, and in this membrane they have a protein. Okay, This protein is called opsin. Okay? called opsin. And opsin has a cofactor. This cofactor is called 11 cis retinal. Okay? Uh, this is a molecule. You can look at its structure on the next slide. Here's 11 cis retinal. One thing to notice about it, though, and we'll get to this in more detail in the next slide, notice that this chain of carbons actually has a bend in it. Okay? It actually bends right here. Okay? That's important. But in any case, 11 cis retinal is the cofactor for opsin. Um, one piece of terminology, when you put 11 cis retinal with opsin, and so it's a complete protein, we call it rhodopsin. So rhodopsin is typically the term you'll hear when it's in a rod, and then also when 11 cis retinal is joined with opsin. Okay? So we'll call it rhodopsin from here on out. Rhodopsin is associated with some G proteins. Okay? So there's three subunits of a G protein. We have alpha, beta, and gamma. Alpha is really the only one we care about, and also the alpha subunit of this G protein is called transducin. It has a special name. So the alpha G protein is called transducin, and these proteins at dark are very tightly associated with rhodopsin. All right, so now that we understand that, let's talk about what's going on in the dark, just like we did in the previous video. In the dark, in order for the photoreceptor to be depolarized, which is what's happening in the dark, you have to have two things here. One, you have to have this second messenger called cyclic GMP or CGMP. That has to be present. And then you also have to have these sodium channels. They have to be open. So these ligand-gated sodium channels must be open. And if those two things are satisfied, then that's what you have in the dark. Now, light. Here's our rhodopsin. Remember, rhodopsin is opsin plus 11 cis retinal. Light strikes rhodopsin. Now, when light strikes rhodopsin, this 11 cis retinal is actually going to do something called a photoisomerization, or we just say it isomerizes. And it isomerizes into something called all trans retinal. Here's the structure of all trans retinal. Notice that this molecule underwent a change in conformation. Here, it kind of had this bend right here. But in the all trans retinal, it's just a straight chain like this, just a straight chain. That isomerization is extremely important and only happens when light hits this protein, specifically the 11 cis retinal. And so when that 11 cis retinal isomerizes to all trans retinal, that activates rhodopsin. Okay? So rhodopsin becomes activated and it releases that G protein called transducin. Notice that. In the second step right here, we have this alpha protein, that's transducin. Notice that it has translocated from rhodopsin over to this protein over here. Okay? This protein is an enzyme, it's actually called PDE, or cyclic GMP phosphodiesterase. Okay? And the action of this enzyme is to hydrolyze or degrade cyclic GMP into regular GMP. Now, why is that important? Well, remember, in the dark, cyclic GMP must be present. But when there's light, we activate transducin, which activates this phosphodiesterase, which is getting rid of that cyclic GMP. It's 
converting it to GMP, which is different. So cyclic GMP is going away. That's one factor that's going to help us perceive light because we can't have that cyclic GMP present in light. It can only be present in dark. All right. Now, what was that cyclic GMP doing in the first place? Well, that cyclic GMP was actually keeping these sodium channels open. And so sodium was rushing into the photoreceptor cell, causing it to depolarize. Remember, in the dark, the photoreceptors are depolarized. And that has to do with the continuous production of cyclic GMP and its action, which is to open these ligand-gated sodium channels, causing sodium to rush in and depolarize the photoreceptor cell. But remember what just happened. We activated this phosphodiesterase, and so we're now getting rid of cyclic GMP in the light. And so regular GMP can no longer keep these channels open, and so these sodium channels close. And now ask yourself this question, is sodium coming into the cell now? Well, no. The sodium channels are closed, and so now you don't have any depolarization of these cells, and so by default, if they're not depolarizing, they are hyperpolarizing. And so really what this is, is the microscopic biochemistry of the photoreceptor cell. What's going on when there's light? So you have activation of rhodopsin and photoisomerization of 11 cisretinal to all transretinal, which causes transducin to move away and activate this phosphodiesterase, which gets rid of cyclic GMP, and so that causes these sodium channels to close, and so by default you have the membrane hyperpolarizing. Hopefully that makes sense to you. The other thing that I want to cover in this video is something that happens with the 11 cis retinal, and that's what we're going to cover here. This blue protein right here is opsin, okay? Just like we had right here, it's opsin. And this little thing right here with the bend in it, that little red molecule, that's supposed to be 11 cis retinal. And if we combine 11 cis retinal with the opsin, we have, of course have rhodopsin, okay? That's what it says right here. So here's our first step. We have light, or photons, we could say, strike the 11 cis retinal, okay? Notice what happens? it isomerizes into 11 transretinal, or what we call all transretinal, which is shown right here. Remember, that's the step that actually causes activation of transducin. But here we're just going to look at what happens with the pigment. Because if we just left the pigment like 11 transretinal, we'd never be able to have another cycle. And so we'd eventually just get light blindness. So we have to regenerate the 11 cis retinal. And the way that we actually get back to this 11 cis retinal is by a process called bleaching or photobleaching. And in this process, this 11 trans retinal or all trans retinal has to be removed from the rhodopsin. And it's removed by a hydrolytic enzyme. It's just one enzyme that does this. Okay, so notice that the all trans retinal has been removed. Then that all trans retinal has to go through a series of enzymatic processes, actually three enzymes are required, to convert it back to 11 cis retinal. Okay, so that's an enzymatic process right there that's ATP dependent. And then that 11 cis retinal is repackaged with another opsin. Okay, so it's reattached to opsin to become rhodopsin, which is what you see right here at the top again, and that regenerates the cycle. And so this process of photoisomerization to all trans retinal, bleaching, enzymatic conversion back to 11 cis retinal, and regeneration of rhodopsin, this is a process that's continuously occurring many, many, many times over all the time, all the time when there's light. And you have to keep continuing this because if you suddenly stopped this process, you would eventually go blind. You'd actually get light blindness because you would never be regenerating the 11 cis retinal, and so then the function of the photoreceptors would fail. Okay, they would fail. Okay, they would never be able to do another cycle, and so eventually bipolar cells would remain activated, and ganglion cells would remain inhibited. So you have to continue doing this, and one thing that can aid in this, especially with age, is vitamin A which you can get from typically orange uh, vegetables like sweet potatoes and carrots. 
in those vegetables is something called beta carotene. And it turns out that in the body, beta carotene is converted to 11 cis retinol. And so that's why people say, oh, you need to eat your, eat your sweet potatoes, eat your carrots to keep your eyesight up. Because that beta carotene, which is what gives those its orange color, is converted to this 11 cis retinol and of course used in this visual cycle. So before we conclude this video, I want to talk about a, just a couple things. I want to put this in perspective so you understand this and don't think it's just some isolated process that we're learning. What we looked at in this slide right here, which is all the biosignaling processes, the biochemistry, all this, this is the function of the photoreceptors when you have light. So this process that I talked about on this slide, that is just occurring in the photoreceptor right here. Okay, so every time the photoreceptor hyperpolarizes in light, that's what's happening right here. Okay, and remember when it's hyperpolarized, it doesn't release glutamate. So that's just this. And then this photobleaching cycle right here, or the 11 cis retinal cycle, this is occurring really just for the purpose of regenerating this rhodopsin. So we kept getting more and more specific as we went through these videos. So I just wanted to put that in perspective that this bleaching cycle is occurring also in the photoreceptor, but it's occurring specifically for the rhodopsin. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. It's not just a bunch of isolated processes. Everything fits together with the photoreceptor. All right, what we're going to do in the next video is we're going to conclude uh, the visual physiology, and we're going to talk about how uh, ultimately we get signals transmitted to the brain. And so in the next video, what we're going to do is we're going to conclude visual physiology by talking about how we get from the ganglion cells ultimately to information traveling to the brain. So join us there. That'll be pretty much the final video in this main set of three for visual physiology. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you very much.